Uh, I'm Victoria Mitchell. I'm going to just sort of have an umbrella role for the day and compare the first two speakers. What we're really hoping for is that there is some lovely, lively discussion. We know that the papers are going to be really interesting, or at least I've got a sense that they're all going to be really interesting. Uh, but we're part of this is about uh, um, engaging in a braiding, dancing, talking. Uh, so it's about the, the talking as well and, and the being able to move things forward for uh, us all. And so do all, we love you all to be involved. Uh, don't feel shy of asking really basic questions or really dense uh, uh, technical uh, questions, uh, I, I, either or theoretical, whatever sort of questions you feel, uh, do, do uh, engage in that. So and and to tease out from the speakers things that you know they know but are keeping slightly hidden for whatever reason. Um, and I, 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 I'm uh, uh, so, for example, I, I have myself, uh, you know, coding and sensors and so forth are, are way outside of my comfort zone technically, but uh, I have a long standing interest in the relationship between text and textile and technology or technique. And it, it seems to me that our talking and our, our textile and our, our technologies uh, are coming, are finding something in dance that. Perhaps you know, is, is a little new to the territory, but, but is, is opening up, and, and so our braiding and dancing. When I've said to people, I've been uh, thinking about braiding and dancing, I kind of almost sense a little light bulb moment, a little a kind of electric impulse that, that, that says, yes, that, that, that's, that's something, yes, or it, it works. There's something a little magical that we're going to, and hopefully today we'll be able to tease out what that uh, uh, light bulb moment is, how, how it might be uh, uh, turned into fantastic outcomes into which we can all share. So, and, and certainly, and I love uh, Kate's uh, title here, um, Making Movement Patterns Through Language, is a, a perfect start to uh, us kind of beginning to tease out some of those things. And, um, and so, without further ado, um, Kate, I just want to say, has um, come all the way from Virginia Commonwealth uh, University, uh, which is a massive, she was telling me, a massive kind of 4,000, 5,000 students just art, well, in arts uh, faculty within that university, it's a massive, where Kate is the assistant professor of dance and media technologies. And she's going to be performing, I know, later this evening, just put a plug in for Kate on, on that front. But Kate, here you go. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, everyone can hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, so I'm Kate, um, I'm a choreographer, um, and over the years my work has um, basically involved technology in various ways. Um, so this is some of my previous work that I won't be talking about today, um, but I've done a range of stuff um, looking at using uh, real-time video systems, sort of to track dancers' movements and make visuals. I've worked with wearable technology, um, making sensors and actuators. Um, Becky, who's in the back, um, collaborated on that project. Um, and this other image is actually um, another type of collaboration I did um, a year ago with a um, mathematician who specifically works with biological systems. Um, it was commissioned from the New York Hall of Science. So those two dancers are a cell um, moving. Um, but today I'm going to talk about um, sort of a, one of the sort of main threads in my practice, which is um, live coding and choreography. This is something I've been doing, I think, since 2011 um, as a way of making dance. And really, it came out of when um, I was doing work with video systems and um, the Kinect had just come out. And so I was hacking my Kinect camera to use in a dance piece. And it was kind of interesting, this, um, the Kinect is, uh, was originally for gaming systems. And so this idea of repurposing something through code became really interesting to me. And that sort of became the starting point of like 
okay, if I can like take something and repurpose it for a dance piece, can I do that within a dance piece? Can I repurpose something in a system and change a system while it's working? Um, and thinking about choreography that way. Um, so the first sort of piece I did this way was called Hacking <coughs> Choreography. Um, show you a little video. Um, so what I did um, within this work was I really looked at this idea of how code could become a score for a dance improvisation and how that could be created live but also um, repurposed and changed live. So in the first um, uh, hacking choreography, I used a pseudocode. So this is a language that um, a computer can't read, right? It's just for humans. Um, and so I programmed the dancers live on stage and then they interpret um, <coughs> the actual um, script, if you will. So the beginning is sort of like defining these things, and then um, it moves on. Um, That's my video. No. So yeah, so it starts with this like defining these terms and defining these movements and then it goes into sort of like a loop of just like movement one, movement two, movement three. But then of course, because it's live coding, I start changing that order on the dancers. So the dancers have to read, know where they are in the score, um, and move all at the same time um, to start. It gets even more and more complicated as it goes on. Um, let me just load. Sorry, we'll move on. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of the first um, experiment I did in this. Um, there's also a lot of interpretation that the dancers um, have to take part in. And so there's a lot of actual, um, people really think of it sometimes as like, oh, you're giving these really strict instructions to dancers and you're programming a dancer. And actually, it's completely up to them how to interpret it. They have a lot of agency in this process. And that's actually, um, something that's really interesting to me is like how much they do something that I'm not expecting. Um, so um, after the first piece, I then made um, what I called Hack and Choreography 2.0. So this actually became um, a piece that um, the computer could read the code. So this was a collaboration with Nick Rothwell um, and then dancer Tara Baker. Um, who's been in a lot of my work and she's in the work tonight. Um, and in this piece, we actually looked at um, how Clojure, which is a programming language, could be used um, as a way to make a dance score. And it was a similar process we had. Um, we projected text. In this piece, we projected it on the floor. Maybe this video will work. Let's see. No, the internet just doesn't like me, sorry. <laughs> um, so yeah, the text moved from the screen to the floor. Um, it would start with sort of instructions for movement and then would add in um, sort of like descriptive words 
and then it would add in body parts. And this is actually um, um, sort of like in dance, we have, yeah, you have a movement motif, and then a way you might develop it is with sort of a qualitative element, or you might develop it with a body part. But it's also, when you look at um, a piece of uh, closure code, you have like your function and then you have your parameters. Um, so there was something really interesting about this, like here's, um, yeah, the function, the movement, and then here's these um, ways of performing it that um, came across in this piece. Um, there's, this piece is 20 minutes long and there's seven sections, and um, three of them, I believe, maybe four, it's been a while, um, are completely generative in that um, the computer is sort of picking the combinations of words that are coming out. And then the, the middle sections um, are actually live coded. So I go in and, and pick the words and, and change them. And then um, we, so we performed this um, in uh, Belgium, in the UK, and then I moved um, back to the States. And um, Tara and Nick decided to continue performing this. So I would actually sit in my living room in Brooklyn at the time and um, live code parts of the performance from there. Um, I was like Skyped into the side of the stage so I could see what she was doing and then would code the um, um, instructions from there. Um, so it actually um, somehow became a telematic piece as well um, through, through this idea of coding instructions. Um, I've done the live coding of performance a lot of different ways. So this is actually, um, a version that is completely non-digital, um, but reflecting digital technology. So this is a piece from Open Platform, which uh, Suzanne Pulser runs here in Sheffield. Um, so this was a non-digital version of Pure Data. Um, so Pure Data is a visual programming language. Um, so you have sort of these boxes that you connect on screen um, to program. So instead of um, boxes on screen, I had these sort of placards with instructions and I'm connecting them with actual strings. Um, and then that becomes a score to perform a movement. Um, so this is, yeah, another version of live coding uh, choreography um, that I did. Um, and then most recently, um, or I have two things I'll be talking about my recent work, but this sort of leads into what I'm working on now. Um, Hopefully the video will work for this. So I've, I've um, been interested in this idea of like, okay, how do I um, make a different scores with the computer? And how can I actually get the computer to inform that process more? Um, the reason for that is like, as much as I love the pseudocode, um, it's still um, me making decisions and um, my own habits and my own sort of um, biases come through in that. Um, what's interesting about the computer sort of interfering with that process is that it comes up with things that I haven't thought of or new possibilities or things that I'm like, no, that's wrong, um, it needs to change. Um, so having the language that the computer can read is interesting. Um, so um, I worked with um, another uh, programmer, Tom Murphy, and we came up with this um, library that works with title cycles. So title cycles is a live coding um, environment for sound and we made a version that will um, let you pattern images, photographs. Um, so let's see if this will play. This one's slightly loaded. Um, So this is kind of an awkward setup in this gallery, but on one side you sort of see um, there where I'm coding. On that other wall is actually um, a series of images that are changing. And then we have the dancer, um, Marissa Forbes, who's responding um, to that change um, in the images. And she's using the images as a score for improvising.
can see the score that she's responding to. interesting about using these still images is that they yeah flash in between each other and they loop in these patterns but dance obviously isn't a series of just still shapes it's actually um, about moving through shapes so that actually becomes the role of the dancer and that's really actually the score is they have to find these in-between moments um, they're like tweeting as we used to say we used to animate and flash Right? They're finding actually how to move through the shape that's presented in front of them. So you just see flashes of the moment um, as they progress through, their, through the piece and the score. Um, and then this is an earlier version. So this is just actually a version where you can see the actual coding. Um, so yeah, again, this is in title. So um, some of this is like the sound version and then up here, anything where you see S is like a combination of, of images. And then, yeah, I'm actually live coding the pattern to change the images. Um, so as a choreographic process, this was interesting to me, this idea of like making these patterns of the images that the dancer can then move through. Um, but what was really unsatisfying was that um, the language that I was using wasn't how I would talk to a dancer in the studio. Um, and that was sort of um, the key thing that was missing. I, I wanted to say like, um, like I would never say reverse. I would always I would be like, let's try this retrograde, or like there's certain key words in choreography that was missing. Um, so that sort of led to the next project, which is what I'm currently working on and what um, the piece tonight will be using, um, which is called Tripsicode. <laughs> um, so this idea of like how to like get all this dance language into a, into a computer. Um, sort of has, um, yeah, been the starting point. So um, this was my office wall for a while. <laughs> um, myself and my research assistants sort of like spent quite a while actually brainstorming like, okay, these are actual words that we use in choreography. Um, so let's start there. Let's start with the words we want to be able to code. Um, and we're still like nowhere near um, this thorough and in the current version, but it was a, this idea of like, okay, how do we talk about composition? How do we talk about um, the body? How do we talk about movement? Um, so yeah, we started here. Um, then we um, um, looked at photographs of movement. So um, these are the images actually we used in the previous piece as well. Um, but we did a process of um, using time-lapse photography. So um, we take two photos a second um, of the dancer moving. So you don't necessarily get like a posed shape. You get these weird sort of moments of, of movement. Um, and then we had thousands of images. So we put them into um, a machine learning algorithm called a T-SNE. 
Um, and what the TSNI does is it actually organizes images based on similarities um, and gives you sort of these clusters. It actually does it in 3D and then you can flatten it into a grid like this. Um, and just to show you a close up, so um, it, yeah, it basically finds images that it thinks that are similar. What becomes interesting is like um, two of these images that are next to each other might not have happened um, actually chronologically next to each other, right? That those two um, might have been an hour apart, for example, because um, we did the process took like two or three hours of getting all the images. Um, so yeah, so it becomes just about finding these shapes. Um, and we use this as a way of actually um, finding clusters of movement that, that we could tag um, and name so that we could call um, upon them in the language. Um, so the clustering process <laughs> then took over my wall, my office. Um, so yeah, we like, um, although we could have done this like just looking at the sort of numbers and the points, it was for some reason we like this was much more satisfying to like actually be like this is a cluster. It's called walking, um, and so this became our process. Um, I have no idea what the correct process for making a programming language is, but this felt good, so we did it. <laughs> um, so yeah, so this is how we tag the movement that we're then going to um, actually call within um, the language. Um, so the grammar um, is still in development, um, but we've sort of narrowed it down to um, three things for now that we're interested in, um, which is movement, timing, and then composition. This is what we're calling it. Um, right now, only the movement and timing is actually implemented, and even that is like limited, um, but it's enough to start to make something um, and see these emergent patterns and for the computer to give me stuff that's different. Um, so yeah, so an example of how you would program this language is over here. So um, yeah, you sort of give it a string of information. So walk, slow, retrograde, um, and that would bring up um, one of the walk images, it would give it a slow timing on how it's changing, and then it would actually be the reverse order. Um, I'll show you an example of this in a minute, um, or at least the, the walk and the slow part. Um, yeah, so on the technical side, this uses um, pig.js as a way of, um, uh, comp uh, it makes a parser um, in order to do this. Um, so like the back end is all JavaScript and then, um, yeah, it makes a, comp this API makes a compiler out of that, uh, for you. And then you can, um, have this sort of mini patterning language on top of it. Um, so here's a little example of it with the dancer.
And then uh, just a quick little demo. This is it, just so. Yes, yeah. no worries. So, um, this. so yeah, you just, um, it takes a second to start because of the timing, but in a minute we'll get image and then we can add um, another one and we'll start to like um, basically add this in. Um, there we go. And we can do another one and so forth. So um, yeah, that's essentially what it looks like at the moment, slightly different from the video. Um, yeah. And so that's that's where I'm at with, yeah, creating a language to pattern dance. So yeah, thank you. <laughs>
um, electronic textiles are textile materials that conduct electricity and can therefore be used um, as a replacement for um, hard components in electronic circuits. So they're really nice way of um, making circuitry soft and bringing it on the body into the textile and build, for example, sensors and, and actuators um, with them. So I'm sure you're going to see a lot more of, of textile work, e textile work over the next couple of years. So um, people often say that they're new, but um, if you look at the material side of it, they're actually very old because they contain mostly metal. Um, so they often contain uh, silver or copper, sometimes um, nickel, steel, or even the very old ones contain gold. So um, if we look back in you know, gold embroidery um, a couple of hundred years ago, it's a really interesting way of looking at them um, today. So I am particularly interested in crafts techniques for e-textiles and how making and working um, with these conductive materials by hand can lead to poetic outcomes. I really like the imperfection of these materials and you can imagine there's a lot of research um, going into them from the engineering side, trying to optimize them, trying to make them better, lasting longer so you can wash them. Um, but they still behave like textiles, so they still are susceptible to humidity and wear and uh, meaning that they're actually not very reliable um, or even even robust, um, which is something that I that I really enjoy. Um, I mostly use uh, surface design techniques, so um, <coughs> unlike um, some of the weavers um, in the room, I use techniques that start from an already existing fabric, um, such as uh, screen printing, um, embroidering, uh, drawing by hand or with a laser cutter, um, or pleating, which uh, is a process in which you fold the fabric into a shape and then you fix it with steam. So there's a lot of experimentation, material experimentation going on, and I'm not sort of specialized in one, in one technique. So in this talk I would try and convey a little bit of my fascination also for repeat patterns and the capabilities of um, shaping the world really and our experience on, on so many levels. So um, I will show you a few projects, some of them are really old, um, um, which I've done over the years which include uh, functional patterns, meaning that they have patterns that lead to another layer of functionality in addition to, to a visual appeal. So I would say that amongst textile designers, and I'm not sure how many um, are in the room, um, uh, amongst us the fascination for a repeat and, and breaking of a repeat um, is actually quite common. And in fact it's something that um, is part of our formal education in which we learn to devise repeats for fabrics or wallpaper with um, patterns that are balanced while featuring contrasts um, which are seamless and rich in colour and, and texture. So we learn to work with the four symmetry prin principles of um, uh, translation, rotation, reflection and, and glide um, reflection on a purely visual basis and within the constraints of the manufacturing process we were designing for. So we have to design for a certain width of fabric and for a certain length um, of fabric and uh, more often than not these repeat patterns are um, or were purely decorative. Which I always thought was a, a lost opportunity because um, patterns um, are just so relevant in so many other ways and contexts. So I asked myself, what more than just being decorative can, can patterns do? And my fascination for e-textiles and repeat patterns sort of developed in, in, par in parallel, which was a, a chance occurrence really. So, this is a design by a designer called uh, Lyubov Popova. She was one of the artists in the constructivists um, group which had formed in Russia just before the October Revolution, um, so around 1917. And this group was advocating art as a, a social practice and they were really interested in designing for the newly forming society um, um, in Russia. So amongst fine art and performance art, there was a lot of theatre art um, which was coming out of it. There was also a distinct textile and clothing aesthetic developing based on very large geometric and, and 
repeat patterns reflecting utilitarian design, functionality and, and also um, equality in, in society. Uh, this is another um, design by uh, um, a designer called Barbara Stefanova. She was sort of the other um, larger textile designer within this movement and she deeply believed um, clothing must also be looked at in, in action. So unlike clothing at the time, which was mostly done for aristocrats, um, which constrained physical movement and was designed for stillness, she really wanted to allow body movement, um, which brought in consideration of how the textile pattern moves not only in space, but, but also in time. So she was designing clothing for uh, particular fields and occupational settings. Um, you can find lots of images of, of workers' uniforms, um, which, um, just to add, was not really realized, but found its way through um, theater um, into society. So this is one of, um, one of the images that show a couple of um, costumes that were made for our play, um, which is called Tarekon's Death, I think, in, in, uh, in English. So, on the other hand, the electronic textiles part um, happened to me when I um, discovered an old magnetic tape in a bin next to my loom when I learned weaving in, uh, in my bachelor um, textile design. So I'm not really thinking even about its sound qualities, I just thought it was a really interesting material um, to work with and to sort of bring some variety into, into my you know, beginner's weaving class. Um, and so I just wove, wove it in and showed it to my tutor and he just, he just said, well that's great, but how do you listen back to it? And that was sort of the, the beginning for me to um, open this new world of working with electronics. And we hacked um, a magnetic uh, tape recorder, took the head out, so we built it into a pen so we could, so we could read back um, what was just woven into the textile. So coming out of this was a first um, patterned e-textile or more sort of magnetic textile project. This is actually from 2003, so it's really, really old. Um, I devised a pattern strategy on uh, duration, magnitude and, and height of both the sound and the visual pattern. I recorded tapes with just one sine wave each, so it was really, really simple, very basic sound, um, so I could build a sound and, and visual structure from bottom up, really. So patterns could evolve on a very small scale. So you can see um, the individual threads here, which sort of build a rhythm. And when reading back, you could move it either very slowly, um, so you could hear almost the staccato of, of the threads, or you can move it much quicker and achieve a, a continuous tone. Um, or I made a couple of larger patterns, allowing a more rhythmic composition, both in uh, visual and, and audio terms. So, and when I said before, um, I'm not a weaver, this really is the only project I've ever done in weaving. So, and I look at it from a much more visual side rather than from, from the construction side. Um, another project I did during my uh, bachelor was uh, Monoline, which is from 2007, in which together with um, audio engineer Daniel Weiss, we connected um, analog noise generators with graphite drawings, so they were simple pencil drawings. Um, here I tried to devise a recipe for, for drawing, for my own drawings, based on electrical resistance and, and resulting sound. So out of this, um, 12 drawings evolved. Um, this being one of them, a very, they all were very simple, very minimal. This was probably the most complicated. There were 50 by 70 centimeters, so they were quite large. Um, and uh, this is the exhibition setup. So each of them had its own noise generator and, and uh, while well, the exhibition, the visual impression of the exhibition was very minimal and very, you know, taken back. It was really loud, it was pure noise and it was a really interesting contrast and also interesting to see how the audience or how the visitors de dealt with it because when they came in, they sort of disturbed the sound as well and different sound was, was emerging. Um, another pattern which I 
ended up writing a PhD about um, was the use of regular conductive patterns to influence electromagnetic fields. So in many ways, electromagnetic waves behave very similar to, to sound waves. And uh, this is one of the um, examples that brought me onto this slightly mad journey into, into electromagnetism. Um, the, the image shows uh, uh, lenses by engineer Winston Cock. It's, a, it's an image from 1948. And I always called them polka dot lenses. And when I saw it for the first time, I just thought, well, great, they work with um, repeat patterns. So I must be, I must be right in this. Um, Koch named these patterns artificial dielectrics, um, which are synthetic composites. They consist of evenly um, spread arrays of conductive material elements, and um, they can reflect refract and absorb electromagnetic waves in, in very specific patterns. So um, they can, you know, out of them comes lighter antennas, uh, smaller antennas, um, um, more functional antennas or, or lenses. And these artificial dielectrics are um, known as a precursor to, to metamaterials. And um, I now have to show a couple of very technical images, which I apologize for, but I haven't really found a way to, to explain it differently, so please bear with me. <laughs> so metamaterials are really curious and fascinating from, from a pattern perspective. Um, so by designing a regular and, and three-dimensional matrix of antennas, so you can see these little, oh, it's not very um, sharp image, but you can see um, from these uh, uh, sort of square shapes. So each square shape, well, it's, it's actually a double square shape. Um, they are two antennas which um, react to an electromagnetic field um, being, um, that they're exposed to and they all interact with each other. And uh, out of this comes a really curious behavior which is a negative refractive index, which is something that just does not exist in nature. Um, a negative refractive index just means that this material refracts light or any other kind of wave, uh, wave in um, in the opposite direction of what we're used to. And you can see um, on the left hand side, this is how every material in this world behaves. So it only ever refracts into this quarter, while with negative index materials, it can go the other way, which is really interesting and fascinating, and um, and offered fascinating opportunities to the scientists who invented them about 20 years ago at uh, Imperial College. Um, and amongst applications, they proposed um, a design for an invisibility clock, um, essentially using rings of these metal materials to divert uh, waves around the space and uh, back on the original path, um, rendering the space in the center invisible to an observer either standing on that end or that end. So that's just an animation of such cloaking device. So usually what you would see is um, once the waves hit this object in the middle, they sort of depart um, because they can't go through this object. But with this, they just go around and they just become plane waves again. And it sort of, you know, um, pretends that the space in the middle doesn't happen. So for me as a textile designer, that was totally fascinating. You can make an invisibility cup. I thought at the time, so <laughs> reality obviously looks very different. Um, and they didn't only talk about these and model these um, clocks, they actually built them. So this was one of the first one that was built in 2006 um, at Duke University in North Carolina. Um, it's about 10 centimeters in, in diameter. Um, it doesn't work with visual light, so it has a much uh, um, uh, lower frequency. and um, but what I just found really interesting about these materials is that um, they use a repeat pattern of antennas with which we can create holes in space. So just really being fascinated by this, I thought, um, well, I should really try and do that with e-textiles. So e-textiles became EM textiles, so it's electromagnetic textiles. And I experimented with um, um, craft techniques again, something, you know, all the sort of techniques that we learn in art school. Um, I did my PhD at an engineering school, so it was also a good 
clash of, of research cultures there and um, I used pretty low tech, non-optimized materials um, giving the textile its space to behave how textiles behave. Um, so this, for example, was an engraving in which I used a laser cutter on a uh, conductive fabric to burn away the parts I didn't want to be conductive. Um, this was one of the first examples. It didn't really work that well, but it looks quite nice, I think. And uh, this was then later a whole sample which indeed had a, had a negative reflective index. Um, and it's, it's not only the, um, that the elements need to be very conductive and very separate, you also need to have a very regular um, array of these, of these materials, which is a big challenge um, um, for, for e-textiles. So this is a, another um, example which was embroidered and it didn't look like that at the beginning, it looked sort of like this. And um, what was really challenging about embroidery is that embroidery is made with one thread. So it sort of is a continuous shape while for the meta material structure we needed the separate shapes. Um, so I experimented a lot with um, the path of embroidering so that um, afterwards I could I could separate them so it, it was a very long very lab laborious um, um, process but we also made it work and we had an embroidered textile that was so to say the first step to an invisibility club so coming back to this question which I don't really want to give an answer to because I think you're all you know, expert in this, and I'm, I'm really waiting to hear more um, from you all today um, and learning about your work. So I'm just going to leave this in the room. Maybe that's something I hope we can discuss um, later on. And thank you very much. Thank you. saying um, this is 2003 and it's really old, yes. <laughs> which I thought was a lovely, I wrote that down, so it's very interesting. But the other, it, it where you talked, uh, just at the end there you said, talked about the, the clash of research cultures, and I, and I kind of wrote down braiding of research cultures, so, so wanting the clash to dissolve into something that we might recognize. And I, I suspect we're from different research and practice cultures here and, and whether um, and how we then therefore can um, work at the interface between on the one hand something which is dancing and on the other hand something which is kind of inside of matter. And they're both, in a way you're both inside of matter, I think. But any, are there any I don't know, what, what would you like? I mean, pattern clearly emerges, but are there things that you think we could, how could we establish a conversation across the boundaries between the moving body? Is the electronic, is the coding, you're not coding, are you, Beric? You're, you're, so, so there's something between coding and matter, between the, elect, I mean, the electronics is, is kind of, something that works between you. Is, is that...? Yes. Pattern is coding. Pattern is coding. To me? Yes. Um, and you see it everywhere, and you see it in nature, and the way things grow, that's coding. So coding isn't pattern so much as pattern is coding? Well, in yes. a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, okay. it's all part of nature, it's all, it's all around us. It's, yes. It's, it's maths, it's, it's visual, it's yes. physical, it's... Yes. Okay. And, and in a way, the least aspect of it is so-called decorative, which the word pattern is very... That's just something that's, that's really rated in visual culture. In visual culture, but in actual so fact, uh, visual culture is, is, is being challenged to not see it always in that way. Yes, Kate? Yeah, I was going to say, I think the thing that really links both of the talks for me 
is sort of sensing the world, like you're, you're talking about sensing, like matter sensing in a new way, and you're talking about like how can dancers sense, or, and I think like the visual, like one of the things I was quite distracted by, and when your dancer was watching, I, I noticed when she turns inside and she just moves, and then when she's looking to find further inspiration or trying to like feedback, she only has that visual cue to like feedback with, and I was thinking about like what are other ways to give her like more sensory information um, so that she doesn't just have to use her eyes. Um, but I do think that both of the talks are really linked by a sense of like how do we, how does the world sense itself almost? Like that's kind of like what your textiles are doing, or like how do different, how do atoms like kind of have sense and do while, you know, I don't even understand really the techniques of it, but that's sort of what it feels like to me. And then how do we, yeah, how do we like do those circuits of sense when we're designing movement or thinking about, I don't know, the, the way that we pass through the world. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's often about having one language to translate it into another language, and I think that's both that's very relevant for for, for both of us. Consensus who give us you know an understanding of what's happening, um, and the same for you. It's actually I mean your dancer is an actuator really, um, so that that that's also I think really interesting. So how you just know you have one set of information and you find a code or something else to put it into another language into another output and coming back to 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 your um, remark I think yes we all work with patterns but the way that we learn about them the way that we apply them is very different in the different um, educational um, um, fields I would say so me as a textile designer I learned it in very in a very traditional way and even at the time, repeat pattern didn't really have a good reputation because everyone thought, well, it's, it's decorative, we don't need this. Um, but learning about pattern um, in other fields just make them so much more interesting. And suddenly I look at a visual pattern and I see it in a completely different way um, than I did before. And so. just walking and watching children growing up and all of those patterns, watching growth of plants, just taking the time to watch for a start. Yeah. But actually seeing all that kind of pattern everywhere, it's just we're so used to prioritising the visual. So it's active. Pattern becomes totally. an a, it becomes a practice. Embodied. It's totally. embodied and it becomes a practice. Can I ask, I, I, I may be the only person here that wants to know, but the relationship between a sensor and an a, actuator, can you just, just open that up for me? So one is out outward, one is feed, gathering information and one is projecting, it's like etic in, et, et in anthropology, so, yes, I think, I, is that right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 okay, yeah. so, so, so the sensor is taking in, it taking in. in. Yeah. so the relationship between sensitivity, because I was interested in how uh, looking at your know, images, your textile images, and, and how, you know, the refinement, which is clo getting closer and closer to something that one, that, that is sensitive to, um, to, to how the body feels or how our eyes perceive or, or whatever it is. And there's a kind of sensitivity, there's a sort of feeling, if, if you like, but then, and how that, how the sensor is being um, uh, technically acknowledged as, as being able to expand that, to make it open, to open up our sensitivity through dance and objects. Is that yeah, I think sort of going on that and responding to something you said, um, so in my work I'm specifically looking at this notion of live coding, which means um, the dancers receiving that information and interpreting it in that moment. So it is about the dancer thinking. So it is not about this looks easy and this is something rehearsed and I'm here to entertain you. It's actually about <coughs> watching a thought process. So there is a lot of sensitivity on the part of the dancer um, being aware and, and also having that cognitive moment of I have to figure out what this is and then do it. And that's actually part of the piece for me. It's not like a distraction or something else. It's actually very much part of why it's live. Because I could have generated a, um, a composition and given it to them to learn um, on a computer. 
but that's not what I'm after. I'm after that moment of thinking, because we don't um, value that in dance, actually, on stage. We want it to look completely polished and done. Um, so it is about this raw sensitivity, um, and then this actuation that comes out of that. Um, yeah, so for me it is very much about, um, yeah, the dancer receiving and having a moment and then going on. So a series of translations. Yeah. With occasional uh, um, uh, 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 misbehaviors so it becomes more like Chinese whispers. Yeah. Uh, and, then, yeah, yeah. and then comes back into something that, that, uh, uh, that we can recognize as, as being the pattern from which yeah. you might kind of do, uh, go away from. Those questions. I mean, one of, one of them has to do with, um, maybe it's primarily to take very typical interest also, how um, the notational languages in your specific disciplines inform the way that you think about code. I mean, I was thinking a bit about, I mean, it's perhaps an obvious reference, but the harmony notation. Mm -hmm. um, certainly in, in the coding context, it feels as if many people have drawn on musical notation in this relationship to code. But I was really struck that the poses that you were identifying felt as if they were also indebted to that kind of notational system. Um, so yeah, it was I think we could talk more about that, or more about how I was really also interested in the way that um, the specificities of your disciplines called for rethinking of the languages that were being used because they have particular terminology uh, that felt very enriching as well. Yeah, so the, the Laban notation thing, um, so yeah, there's several kinds of dance notation out there. Laban is one of the more popular ones, although no dance notation, I would say, is popular. It's not um, a common practice. Um, the common practice is to video the dance, and as a dancer, you receive a video, and you're like, you're second to the left, learn it. <laughs> That's our notation <laughs> these days. Um, so yeah, but there is this tradition of, um, Laban notation is actually, um, patterns of shapes um, is actually um, what it looks like. But what I've sort of drawn out of um, Laban's work is his terminology. So um, particularly his work around um, describing qualities of movement. Um, so something called the Laban effort graph. Um, so that's something I pull on a lot within my work. Um, so yeah, when uh, movement is light versus strong, right? Or um, free versus bound. Um, so those terms actually come through um, in the language I'm working with. Um, rather than the actual notation itself. Um, but there's definitely, yeah, um, something from that. I also don't, um, even though it is, in a sense, a notation, I'm not thinking it as a notation at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I am very much thinking about it as like a generative process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, um, but all live coding sort of, there's those lines like, yeah, what is this <laughs> um, kind of thing, yeah. Um, and then um, the second part, I had something to say about linking our two things. Um, it will come back to me, yeah. I mean, maybe there's a little bit that I could add yes. on to, which is also to do with what seems to be this dilemma between how, how you articulate um, a kind of practice that is a continuous practice, it's a practice in movement, in flow, through systems that require a discontinuous system of notation. And I was struck by you say yeah. embroidery is a continuous thread, but in order to make the yes. e text that had to be broken into separate units. Um, and then Kate with yours, there was something of the movement of dance being articulated through discrete poses. Yeah. Um, and I was very struck by the way that the dancer was also seeming as if she was moving into a pose as destination. And I'd be really curious of what would be of those points were not destinations, but transitional points. Yeah. Because so it seems as if she stopped almost at each point and then began again. Yeah, yeah. So that dancer Marissa does do that. I've also worked with this other dancer, Teddy, who never stops. Mm -hmm. And like that's usually the note for him is like sometimes you have to pause. <laughs> but he he could like never stops moving. Um, yeah, and that's a really interesting thing with the embroidery too, this like making these discrete moments so it can be um, electronic and that's like an, an issue slash interesting point with using still images um, that like um, I've started to think of them as like 
samples, right? Like this, there's this one discrete moment um, of movement um, that I'm sampling. Um, and what's one of the reasons why sort of the back end of my work is JavaScript is because like I'm, I'll eventually expand out to maybe short video clips. Um, why I like this sort of like random my sampling through the time lapse photography is I don't have to decide where something begins and ends. The mechanical um, camera does it for me. But when I move to video, I'll have to decide where a gesture begins and ends, and I really don't <laughs> want to. <laughs> That's very interesting. About in a sense taking the ego out of the process in order to enable the process to kind of be generative. As yeah. as a, a, a moment of thinking about the relationship between pulse and impulse. So I can see this kind of pulse and, and, and impulse. Yes, Dave. Okay, so I was thinking, why did you choose written text as your form of instruction oh, as opposed back. to verbal, you know, as a sort of post-tradition of kind of calling to instruct dancers to perform patterns or mm -hmm. to just mm -hmm. what was your, this is my advantage, obviously as a tech I mean, I have done it that way. So, like, this is a small sampling of what I've done. I have scores that are completely verbal, where I stand on stage and read <laughs> um, to the dancers. Um, I also have um, my work with eTextiles is haptic instructions on the dancers. Um, so I've done it every way. Um, I think what I'm interested in right now is that the computer can give me a new pattern, um, and that's what I'm interested in right now. Is like actually putting in an input to the computer. I mean, I could, you know, use a, a voice to text um, and talk to the computer too. Um, but yeah, right now um, there is something, um, yeah, about sitting and like using that process um, to to um, try to interrupt the choreographic process. Yeah. What I also found really interesting when observing the video is that you said. I sometimes ask myself, is she actually looking at it, or is yes. she just making it up? Yes. So, because with a with a um, written um, recipe and it's just projected onto one wall, you know, you always sort of have to either look at it straight or you have to see it from the corner of your mm -hmm. eye. But you need to have an eye on it. While with verbal verbal um, communication, you can sort of move more freely, I would think. But she didn't seem to be restricted by this, so um, it was also interesting to see. You know, it wasn't a facing just one side type of movement, it was really all around. Yeah, because the instruction isn't to do exactly what's on the screen. The instruction is to be inspired by that. So you can miss parts of it. You can just look and see one thing and go with it for a while and come back. Um, and that's, that's okay within that work, yeah. I, did think, I, did, I think that was very interesting, it made me think about voice. Uh, so, so something that is a dancing of of, of how we we kind of speak in a way, or how we sing, um, and how you can use voice in extraordinarily magical ways if you have somebody who's a specialist in doing things with their voice and or, and or singing. So, you, how you could shape movements through the way that a word is the, the intonation of, of a word. And I think there's really something interesting there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. For me, that was an incarnation of jazz. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So improv improvisation. improvisation. Yes. Yes. And and it's interesting how it was interesting to see your studio space and and I, I imagine um, or, or or laboratory. But I don't know how you would define the space where you you know kind of uh, or your bedroom where I'm not sure you know. But it's but it's that sort of space of of, of making of the ideas pro making progress. Uh, is interesting, and whether it's a laboratory, which I guess, in, in Barrett, I guess in your case is probably more exper where experiment and improvisation, which is your jazz, where those two to um, meet, which is I think interesting. Mm -hmm. Maybe I yes, think yes. So I mean, yeah. I can see the jazz thing, but actually one of the things that also connects the two is that there's a constraint that's applied very strongly. So actually, although there's a promise of improvisation. The constraint mechanism is a very strong component. Um, because, in a way, when, when you describe actually both of them, there are real limitations within this. But they don't feel as if the limitations are failures. Like, if only you get beyond the limitation of the 
able to do whatever it feels as if there's something about that, that constraint that's a necessary ingredient of these practices, how we move against it, especially, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, I, I agree to that. Um, I mean, in my case, it's the it's the material constraints, um, while at the same time, as a crafter, I work with these materials, I don't know what they're evolving into, and I have to allow these materials to evolve into something, so it's not necessarily something I can 100% control, which I think is really interesting, especially in this field, because um, it's, as I said, uh, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of optimization going on, so we really want to control these materials, but it's very difficult to control them, and I think that's where the beauty, the, the poetry comes out, um, because we can observe, you know, chance encounters with, with these materials, and I suppose for you it's the same, in your case it's a human, totally right. unpredictable, <laughs> um, so yeah, so you probably have less control than, than I have. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah, it, yeah. And people like I think talk about my work in the sense of like, oh, you're controlling this dancer, and it's like actually every piece is so different. Um, yeah, because it's how that person is reacting with their body in that moment. Yeah, it's all the stitched together in 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 translation. <laughs> the stitch, the idea of the the kind of uh, the code, the stitches, the code in a way is very interesting. And so the relationship I think we we talked about this earlier between flow on the one hand, and division or separation, the, the, the marking the spot, yeah. Yeah. And, and yet, uh, in the end, something. I want to ask you both, I just, uh, uh, yes, I need to look into hands first. I just wanted to ask you very both, where next? Do you have um, a, a something that would be kind of, what, what, what in four years' time? Do you, um, yeah, you know, where, where, do, where the generative process, let's say, far into the future, technology <coughs> will change, so you'll be keeping up with that, I guess. Is that, is that, uh, well, you, can, you can name the number of years ahead, but you <laughs> <laughs> can, can see. But, Four years is probably a good, a good time span. Um, but uh, I'm currently working, and I've just started working with with this, so I, there wasn't really much to show yet, but um, I started working with a pleating artist, and uh, pleating is the process of uh, folding fabrics and fixing it with heat and, and steam, so it's a very, it's a very um, cr crafty process, um, one might say, but it's also um, the, the, the results, the sort of three-dimensional textiles is something that is interesting to a lot of disciplines, so engineers work with it a lot. You find pleated space antennas, you find um, pleated um, 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 implants for, for medical applications, but um, it's also very popular in, in fashion, um, so high fashion um, um, companies still work with this very beautiful process of making the pleats by hand, by moulding them by hand. And that's something I'm exploring together with um, Arancha Villas. Um, she's got a um, studio in Brighton um, to figure out how we can turn these beautiful, shaped, three-dimensional textiles into sensor um, arrays, really, to see what we can learn about body movement, how we can apply it in, in performance. Um, so that will be my next three years. So the dancer, <laughs> maybe, in, in, yes. yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kate. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so continuing working with this idea of um, the language and how this can develop. Um, so right now it's really in the beginning stages. So there's these movement tags and there's um, time um, elements that are in it, but the actual compositional elements of the patterns um, isn't um, made yet. That's like the next immediate step is to get that. Um, sort of working, um, and then figuring out, um, so yeah, this moving beyond the still image is um, something I really want to explore, um, not just with video, but also with um, motion capture data. Um, with motion, motion capture. capture. So I've been yes. using that a lot, um, because then um, video you still get this very flat um, sort of image of dance, and dance isn't flat at all, it's, it's very much um, 360. Um, and so what happens when, yeah, now all of a sudden you have this, yeah, thing that you can rotate in space as well as um, pattern. So um, 
that's, yeah, something with motion capture <laughs> is sort of like the next um, thing that I should be doing in four years. I was just thinking about kind of language and how you describe the fields that you have are, 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 are sort of evolving. And I, I kind of got as far as e-choreography, but it's a bit grim, isn't it, as a word? But there's a kind of choreographic uh, um, process, in a way, in using an old word. And, and But e, how, so how, how we, we need to work on how we, uh, perhaps at the end of the day, we have, have devised a, uh, the name for the field. Yeah, there's choreographic coding is one uh, sounds um, term yeah. that's used a lot. Okay. Um, but even that, I think, means exploding a bit. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, we'll think on that. Good. We'll have, we have a little break. We are out of time, amazingly, I think, unless there are any more questions. We'll have a little, a little comfort break and come back in about 15 minutes. How does that sound? And then um, I've lost my bit of paper. Uh -huh. Uh, and then we will see her, we'll take over and Sandra and Tony will come be talking to, to you. So lovely, thanks so much. Thank